Welcome to Shake Up Connecticut. And I don't have this costume of death on to, because it's Halloween, I have it on to uh, talk to you about uh, in this one hour show about what will happen to Connecticut if we do not change uh, who's in Hartford on November 6th. I put my happy jacket over here. I've hung it up, and I will not put it back on to after the election. We know if things are going to go in the right direction in Connecticut. We need to make a substantial directional chain, change on November 6th by putting in conservative, smart, and frugal people as our new governor and legislatures. I, my guest here tonight, and I'll tell you who he is soon, are going to show you some frightening things in this show about the future of our state. And next week, I'll be back on with Shake Up Groton, where the future is no brighter for Groton than for our state if we do not change our local and state government. I want to show you my usual, my mascot, um, our bull. Um, I have put on him. He now represents for this show the state of Connecticut. I'm the the matador, and you can see he has a, a blinder on. And that is the problem. That's been the problem the last eight years in, with Malloy in the House and Senate. They have blinders on to what is going on in Connecticut. You can drive around Connecticut and see these problems. You don't have to, uh, it doesn't take a genius to figure this out. Um, so like Ebenezer Scrooge, we once enjoyed a wonderful past. If you remember a Christmas Carol, Ebenezer Scrooge's past was very nice. And then as his life went on and he became more miserable, um, he started, his life deteriorated. And our life started deteriorating when Weicker brought in the income tax initially. And then we had steady increases in the inheritance tax, driving more people out of Connecticut. And then property tax have gone through the roof. And we're going to talk about a lot more in my next show. 14% increase in 2017-18 fiscal year in Groton alone. I don't know if you remember Alo Grasso. She gave the teachers binding arbitration, which means uh, their pay has gone higher for similar type of uh, education and such through the roof. With They never go on strike. She tried to present, prevent that. And I'm going to take this thing off because it's hot. Um, so I have learned a, a bit in the past couple of days, spending time with my guests here and learning about the huge mistakes Malloy has made with the liberal majority in the, both the House and the Senate. If my results from this show is that we change Hartford in no, on November 6th, then it, I'm, I'm here to scare you. That's what this show is about, because this is scary. And I can tell you personally, I put aside, I've said this in other shows, now I have to put aside $3,700 a month just to, to maybe pay my taxes. Now, the only people have a logical, as we know, it's Lamont, Ned Lamont is the Democratic opposition. If you're for Lamont, the only reason I could think of that you would be for Lamont is if you get some kind of benefit from the present situation uh, in Connecticut. And that's either if you're, you're on some kind of uh, helping situation from the state or you're an employee of the state with a contract that will not be sustainable. Um, and I wanted to point out to you that I am not under any control of the Republican state headquarters. Um, and I believe the swamp in Connecticut is even swampier than in Washington. And this chain represents that. This chain is a chain around all of our necks, and it is dragging us down. And I also want to point out that I am a registered Republican. I've said this in my other shows. And this is show seven, by the way. But in the last election, I believe I voted for more Democrats than Republicans. So I don't really go by party lines. I go by 
what we need the to improve the economic future for Connecticut. So I don't care what party you're in. I care what you believe in. So you're going to get the truth out of me. And I just read that next to Puerto Rico, Connecticut is in the first, and they're not a state, but they're treated as a state. They're, we're second to Puerto Rico, Rico being in the worst financial condition of any state in our nation. So this is an incredibly important election. Um, I believe this election is going to determine the survivability of Connecticut. And I want to tell you, because a lot of people are confused about taxes. And let me go through it quickly. Locally, your property tax, which is collected by your town, pays for the schools. That's for the school's salary, the, the salaries of the teachers, and for maintaining the schools. Then the state, and every state is different, in Connecticut, the, 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 we have an income tax and we have a sales tax and there's various other fees and such and those support the retirement of the teachers. It's a bit confusing and they in your DOT and keeping the roads and all of that. Then you have the federal government who collects an income tax also and that's for federal highways and for all the people in Washington, the defense um, side of things. So this show um, will show on Tuesday at 8.30 p.m., Thursday at 8 o'clock, and Saturday at 9.30. And my next show, which is, I'm giving an indicator on my visor here on Groton, and a big issue, just as important as uh, voting for the governorship and all the people in the House and Senate in, in Hartford, uh, is on the big question that's coming up. Uh, in Groton. And that show will be on October 29th, uh, which is a Monday at 5, Wednesday at 9, Friday at 7, and Sunday at 7. I will say this again at the end so you get your paper out. So I have a guest here uh, who's running for the Republican House uh, Senate. Uh, not Senate, I'm sorry, House of Representatives, um, John Scott. Uh, welcome, John. Thank you. And uh, I'm, th I'm, I'm happy we got this show together rather quickly, um, so I thank you for that. Well, thank you for having me. Your competition is Democratic inco incumbent uh, Christine Conley. Mm -hmm. uh, and running as the other state rep, you're the 40th district, right. is Ken Richard. I don't know what district. Do you know what district? The 41st. Is? 41st. And his opposition, who is the incumbent, is Joe Dela Cruz. Right. Um, and I'm going to comment on the two incumbents, which happen to be two Democrats. With, in my personal experience, they have been both extraordinarily unresponsive. I have called both multiple times, and I receive absolutely no phone calls back, which I think is terrible. Um, and my additional comment about Joe Dela Cruz is he is a one-issue person, and it's about the heroin addiction problem, which his son, I, I'm sorry that he has this, but, you know, I think for that to improve, we've got to get jobs, and I think working people will be less prone to take drugs. So I think that's going to help that, but Joe doesn't want to talk about that. Um, so we had an awful thing happen to, on Monday with uh, John Scott, and it tells you the perils of running for office. Right. Maybe you could tell the folks about what happened. Well, we got an anonymous uh, email from our, through our website uh, that was basically a threat of, of uh, me being beat up if I happened to show up at somebody's door. Don't know what door it is. I've still got a boatload of doors to knock on. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. We do have the information off of our website. IP addresses are trackable. Um, so it's in the hands of the police and the state's attorney's office is very serious about prosecuting this because, I mean, this, this is a serious threat. You have to take them all seriously. You don't know if this person was serious or just being angry um, over something that I'm not even connected to. Um, but the reality is, is that, you know, in America, we can agree to disagree. You know, we're, the two of us sitting next to each other today, we may not agree on everything. But the beauty of this is that we can say, you know, Gretchen, I don't agree with you. But to say, I, I, to call me a bunch of names and to threaten me with physical harm, that's not American, and that's not the way this country was built. Right. And quite frankly, if we don't stop this behavior, 
um, I think we'll, we'll have less people willing to run. That's right. Nobody and so will it, run. It, it needs to stop. And I just want to comment, why, did the, why is the Democratic Party act this way? I don't think it's doing them any good. Um, you know, I had to put up, I was not happy with Molloy, um, and I didn't go out and threaten people. I right. had to live with it. Right. Um, so, so you, this is your second time running. You lost to, to uh, Con Christine Conley right. last time. Could you talk very briefly about sure. why it, you think um, that? Yeah, it was the presidential year, and uh, uh, Groton uh, went decidedly uh, for Hillary in the 40th district. And uh, just, uh, I lost by what appears to be almost the exact same number that Donald Trump lost in the 40th right. district. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I figured that there's a lot of uh, Navy families in town. The actual uh, sailor and their spouses uh, are registered to vote uh, in their home state, but there's a lot of support families here. In, um, and they have to register well, here. Well, let's not repeat that. No, okay? no, I, I'm working real hard to... Uh, Bob Stefanowski needs help in the House yes, of Senate. Does. If we yes, don't get a majority to help Bob, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna be here. You see this? This is a uh, tombstone, and that's where Connecticut is helping, and I'm serious. This is no joke. We are running out of money in Connecticut. We're actually technically out of money. We have a $5 we are. billion dollar we are broke. facing. And I, at some point, I believe, and it's not far off, and that maybe will force the unions to their knees, there will be no paychecks. Mm -hmm. And th that is coming. Maybe it has to come to that. But we need these guys in to provide ideas and alternatives. Vote for Bob. Vote for Republicans, okay? Um, now, this show, we're going to proceed... Um, we got some excellent stuff here. We're going to show you the first part of the show. We're going to show you graphs to show the, the, the serious problems. Um, and then John has some specific topics. He's got more than this hour show <laughs> that are problem. dear to his heart, which will help some of his top problems. And maybe Bob's going to listen because he needs to get a little specific too. Sure. And I think we're going to be more specific than Bob has up to this time. Um, so let's bring up the... Uh, First graph. Okay, and this is um, showing us. Um, this is the gross state product. I'm sure you've all heard, all heard of the gross national product. Gross national product is how much uh, a nation produces in a year, and so every state has a gross state product, and you can see the. Was, uh, Wyoming, New Mexico, and Connecticut are in the bright red, way on the left side, and we are have the worst gross state product. So this results in no jobs. We don't have growth in industry. Um, we can't attract industry here. I'm going to tell you. You know, I don't know. I'm going to. I haven't done my economic development show yet, but I I own unfortunately a lot of commercial property in in Groton area. And I can't get investors. I had one guy from Boston who does private placement equity, and he said he wouldn't touch Connecticut with a 10-foot pole. That's really bad. So comments on this chart. Well, these, these charts come from uh, the think tank, uh, the Yankee Institute here in Connecticut, and they're always analyzing the financial condition, condition of the state of Connecticut. And, and we are uh, basically one of the third worst states uh, when it comes to uh, financial c condition and, and uh, economic growth. Um, and, you know, it, uh, well, I'll probably say this multiple times, but we lose 60 people a day. And some people are now According saying it's, Stephan, it's, a, yeah, he's it's saying 80. 80. Um, the statistics I had seen, and that comes from a report that Yankee Institute did a year ago, is that 60 people a day, we lost $600 million in revenue. And what that means is when those 60 people a day move away, they take with them their income tax payments to the state of Connecticut. They take with them their purchasing power, so we're not getting their sales tax revenues anymore. Mm -hmm. And in investment income, we're not getting the taxes off of that. Right. I mean, we're, we're losing all that stuff, right. as well as their ability to volunteer in the community, their philanthropy and, uh, at local churches. I mean, we're just, all that is, is leaving the state. If you're in the military, when you get your orders to relocate, the first thing they tell the military personnel, that, like the second they get home, is to arrange for a moving company because the moving companies are booked solid. Um, so right. it's, it's, a, it's a sad state of affairs. One of my shows I talked about, it costs $800 to move from Florida to here, but it was like $2,800 to move out of here, meaning there's much more demand for rental That's trucks right. to move out than to move in. Well, I mean, U-Haul just built a huge new facility here in Groton. 
right? But we no. just lost the U-Haul. Yeah. All right, let's go to the next chart. Okay, uh, this is this this chart to me says it all. It says since 1970, it goes from 1970 to 2017. We have a 300 percent increase in spending in Connecticut. State spending. State spending, right? right. Um, so that's the red line. Then the blue line is the income, which has only increased uh, 120% since 1970. Right, that's our gross product. And then the black line on the bottom is our population, which actually since 2015, we'll show that in the next chart, this has got such a big window that it doesn't show, it's, we're going down, right. our population. So. As many charts that I've showed you about Groton in the past, the income and the increase in spending to line should be, for a healthy economy, should be parallel. And these are not, obviously. Obviously, the rate of increase of spending is going up much faster than the, the slope of the line for income. Right. Go ahead, John. Well, it, it, the state spending is an issue, and, and people argue that we need more income. That's why they're wanting to, the Democrats in particular, want to increase taxes. They want to talk about putting tolls on the highways. So, so the reason for that is they want to continue to spend okay. recklessly. And, Can I and, interrupt sure. uh, a second? Frank, why aren't we getting a camera on John when he speaks? Okay, go ahead, okay. John. Well, I mean, it, as I said, you know, the, the, the state... The Democrats, as they're running things, they're they're looking to increase uh, spending, um, and that's why they want more revenue. They they don't they don't seem to want to cut anything, and and they've created union contracts that we were handcuffed for another four or five years, uh, where we can't lay anybody off. Uh, benefits are fixed and firm. Right. Um, you know, I, I talk about my neighbor all the time. Uh, he works for the state of Connecticut, Department of Children and Families. And he has an ID badge that he wears on his belt. It's got his picture and his uh, name, and it's got an ID number. Yeah. And that ID card has the technology where he can buzz himself in and out of the building where he works. But when he gets into work, he goes to someone's desk, and he opens up a notebook, and he has to sign himself in. And later in the day, he signs himself out for lunch. And at the end of the day, he signs himself out to go home. Mm -hmm. And all of his coworkers go to that same notebook. It's someone's job to data enter all that information right. in the state's computer right. system. And that's just one example of why aren't we taking advantage of technology? That same ID badge that he uses to right. buzz himself right. in and out of the building and perhaps all kinds of different rooms, right. why can't he run that over a little device that keeps track of his payroll? Right. And that, I mean, that's the type of thing that we're not But it keeps jobs. He, that person who does that is probably in the union and they can't destroy that job. More than likely. So the right. union is more important than you, the taxpayers, okay? That, that's where it's come to. And the union is the fourth yeah, I call part it the fourth, of government, the fourth branch of government in, in state Connecticut. Right. They have won, and we're going to explain more and more reasons why they right. have won. But they're not going to win because at some point their employees are not going to get right. paid. That's coming. Well, you know, before you leave this chart, though, I think it's important to to, to talk about you know the income uh, versus the spending. We we don't have an income problem here in the state of Connecticut. We have a spending problem. Uh, if we can roll back some of our spending, we don't need to increase taxes. We don't need uh, to put tolls on the highway. Right, but there we don't agree, uh, <laughs> John. We have an income problem because businesses are leaving and they bring income in. Right, but we and Groton we, here, 50% of the storefronts are em oh, empty. So it's, it's sad, you can't tax that. They're gone. Right. All right. So. But that's where I keep but saying. But you're, you're saying income's only taxes. Well, I mean, from, you know, but there's businesses that. I'm sure are happy to pay reasonable taxes, but they're not going to come. Here. Right, because, well, the, the taxing structures and the regulatory structures are such that businesses uh, just aren't coming here to the state of Connecticut. Right. Let's move on, Frank. Okay. This is the, a compacted or version of the tail end of the last graph, where the population. This shows you, I, I had it wrong, since 2013, our population is going down. This is pretty self-explanatory. Right. People are voting with their feet, folks. They're leaving. And just think, if the budget doesn't go down, it goes up. We right. keep spending more. That means less and less of you, and I've explained this regards to Groton, less and less of you, you've got to pay more and more. So your taxes are going to go up. Unsustainable, folks. Unsustainable. Let's move on. This one is interesting. It's a little hard to understand. And this shows you Basically, two things. It shows you that the 
the dip in the green line and the purple line is, is, was in the green line the 25 to 34 year olds. Mm -hmm. And then over time, from 2004 to 2014, it's moving to the next age group, which is 34 to 5 to 44. And that's your real work. I mean, that's the, sure. the core of your working life is right. in that age group. And these people who have to earn an income for their families are leaving. Right. And that's what this chart's showing is that they're leaving. They can't survive here. They got to go and find right. work elsewhere. I think it's also important to point out that in the 65 and older, you're starting to see a dip as well. And, you know, as I'm knocking doors, and I've already yeah, knocked right. on thousands of them, uh, you know, I, I, people will say to me, you know, I'm so tired of the state, uh, the taxes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, once my kid graduates high school, once, my, once some milestone happens, for sale signs going up and I'm out of here. And, and that, that is a, a, a frightening thing. I mean, again, those movement, you're losing 60 people a day or 80, depending on whose number you're using. You know, these, these are people we'd love to have stay here in the state of Connecticut. And it's not because they don't want to deal with our winners. It's because they don't want to deal with our taxes. They want more green in their pocket and their bank account. It's interesting. Our own town manager, John Burt, has said once his son graduates, he's going to yeah. leave. Okay? Right. Because he said it's too costly. He comes from Michigan. So it's way too costly. Here. Right. Okay, let's move on. Now, this is a little hard to understand. This is average gross income. This is a really interesting chart. And this shows the income of people who once lived here, and it's migrating to other states. So this means that that income, and the, pro the number you want to pay attention to, and it's showing it from 2011-12, and then the right chart is for 2012-13. So, for example, Florida, the net AGI, meaning the difference between inflow and outflow, um, is it was 1.3 million in 2011-12, uh, and then it, it it's not grossly different, 1.0, almost 1.1 million in 2012-13. So that is non-taxable. That's income. Right. So it, this chart basically shows the adjusted gross, in, adjusted gross income that left the state right. in those two years. Right. Uh, and, and these are a little bit old. It's about six years old, but the, right. the numbers aren't changing. And it shows, I'm sure they're worse. Now. Yeah, and it shows the states where most of the m money is going to. And so, right. you, know, we, we, you know, losing Florida for the 2011 and, and 12 line, you know, we lost $1.6 million. We gained 250000 for a net of $1.3 right. loss. It's interesting. I just, uh, look at where foreign is. A lot of people are yeah. leaving the country. Even yeah. look at it in 2012, yeah, 13. Years, lost some money. It's number two next year. Even Rhode Island Florida. is getting some of our people. You know, it's, it's, right. And that's the thing. I mean, we, we've created an environment um, where where people are voting with their feet, and and it's just, we've just got to turn that around. It's a great state to live. There's so many positive things. There's so many good things here, but we've created a, a, a bad environment, and that's what has to change. Um, and that will only change with the change in leadership uh, at the governor's mansion and a change in leadership in the House and the Senate. Right. Don't forget that, folks. You just changed the governor. Uh, I think we have had a governor where the majority in the House and Senate was not the same party as the governor, and nothing gets done. Well, it, the, for 38 years, we've had Democrat control in the House and the Senate, right. and for eight years, we've had Democrat control in the governor's mansion. We have had Republicans in the governor's mansion, but they're handicapped, they're handcuffed right. when we have a Democratic-controlled legislature because right. you know the governor can create a budget all day long. Um, but the reality is, is the House and the Senate that takes it apart and right. puts it all back together right. and, and makes the final decision on that stuff. And then, then the governor can veto it or, or ignore it and just let it become right. law or sign right. it. Um, but the, the legislature is the body that's making the financial decisions, whether to include a, a new program or right. expand a, a government agency or something along those lines. So, you know, we need a change in leadership in the House, in the Senate. We're, we're five votes away in the House. The Senate is tied. Yeah. Um, but the you know lieutenant governor breaks that tie when the, when it's 1818. But you know the, we we need to swing it back so we have 19 or or more in the in the Senate, and we need the five new faces and right. retain of course our our existing people uh, to get the majority um, in the in the House. Right. You know the, the reason the budget took so long to pass was uh, this year was the numbers are so tight in the legislature. The, you know the, right. the the Democrats are used to when they have a bigger majority of right. a handful of their people siding Things with the Republican. Right. Well but it, but they with numbers being so tight they couldn't afford to lose any of their votes. So right. they had to get their 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 people that would have gone with us to 
agree to the budget, and it took a lot of negotiating that they weren't used to doing. It was really a disarray up there for the Democrats. Right. right. Um, Republicans, you know, month after month were churning out, how about this budget? I'm idea? sure Christine Conley and Joe Dela Cruz don't know these numbers that we're looking through. They don't want to know. They're well, like they, my bull here. They right. have the, the Well, you know, it, the she, she may on. not know. I, I, I can tell you that I'm supposed to do a debate with her on Friday, and she yeah. refused to allow it to be televised. Why? Um, because I, I, she may not know the information. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, we're doing it at Ledger High School. It's during the yeah. school day. Okay. You know, I graduated from Ledger High School. I know full well that you can uh, set us up on the auditorium stage, right. put cameras just like in this room. They're focused just on us. Right. But she's concerned uh, that there are children that are have, that their parents have said they can't be photographed, but they can still participate. They can sit in the Lame audience and, and they just won't be photographed. Why should children excuse. see yeah. our democracy? At play right it's not, that's a nice it's going to be a great event I, i'm looking forward to it and and with or without cameras and she seems uh, to be a bit confused what are federal issues and state issues and local issues mm. and joe, yeah. joe delacroix does the same thing they do the same thing they yeah. think uh, a lot of this immigration or this uh me too movement that's mostly federal level yeah it's happening at a lot of different levels but uh you know the the uh, immigration um stuff she got involved with uh anti uh ice rally right. um and uh um, was actually photographed uh, with a small child, a three-year-old child, from my understanding, holding a handmade sign that said "Abolish ICE." Um, you know, the the agency has certainly had some bumps in the road. A lot of the stuff that's happening with that agency go back to the prior administration, um, and maybe they do need to have their standard operating procedures updated uh, to reflect a but better that's way a to federal operate. Issue. But it is, but it's still a federal issue. It has nothing. To, it's just okay. a distraction. You can't. From the, if you get yeah, elected, no you, can't, you have no you know, say. I, I say all the time. You know, that it, people are. Con, you it's know. a distraction, John. Sure. We have. You know, I don't know. if We'll have time, but these legislative bodies tend to waste a lot of time. The Democrats on a lot of nonsense, not stuff that actually helps. Well, they, they, it's all theatrics. They want you to. You know, they're, they're, the Democrats are so concerned about losing the election this year. Uh, that they want you to not think about how they've destroyed the state of Connecticut financially. Right. So they're going to so say... they distract you. Well, they're going to distract you with things like right. Trump and ICE and, and right. all this other stuff. And, oh, they spent how many hours on those uh, things that kids jump through in the summertime? Uh, oh, the splash pads. Splash pads. Yeah, pads. that happened when I was up if, there. Yeah. Uh, three hours, you told me, I think yep. they spent uh, in the state legislature, in the House. In the House, we do debating. On discussing, debating. Leave that up to the towns. Right. That right. shouldn't be a state right. issue whatsoever. Right. But that's what they spin their wheels well, I mean, on. Folks. So they spin their wheels on that stuff. And, and just to say one more point about the distractions, you know, the, the President of the United States, I don't care who is or was, has no say in the day to day operations of the state of Connecticut. Yeah. That's what I that's hopefully true. will be hired to right. do. Uh, that's what the, the House and the Senate and the Governor of the state of Connecticut, that's what we're, that's what we're all responsible right. for. And to try to pair us up with any sitting or potential president isn't fair because, again, that president has no say in the day-to-day -day right. operations. That's right. Next graph here. Shares of income tax growth from 91 to 2004. This is a really interesting, and it surprised me, this chart, especially the top number. So I didn't know human service was consuming so much of our, our taxes. So this is what your income tax is going towards. And you can see the growth has been mostly in human services and um, general, no, I think education is the next blue down uh, above the red. And the red is pretty high too, and that's the non-functional. So this is kind of a repeat of what we are saying. It's telling you your income tax is going up and it's showing where we're spending this money. Um, I think we should be spending most money in economic development. Um, so any comments on this one, John? Well, I mean, it, you know, the human services piece is, is, a, is a delicate subject to talk about. I mean, it, it, this, is, this is a jobs situation, um, and, and it costs us money to uh, support these people. And I think there's some policies and procedures that we can put in place, maybe duplicating what the state of Maine has done uh, that can lower that expense and, and make people productive again. But that, that's something we can certainly take a look at. Going All right, forward. the next one. And I think the left graph is self You know, we all know this. These pension payments are going berserk. I think the right graph is really something. It's a ski slope upwards, just like Groton's budget. Um, so the red line is the total of the two graphs. The black line is uh, 
the civil servants, and the the blue line is teachers. Right. Um, and you can see both of them are going uphill like right. an, like a jet, a fighter jet taking off. And this is not. This is really what's. This is well, killing again, this, us. This is 38 years of mismanagement of the budget. I think they just kept kicking the can down the road and uh, expecting that next year we'll get we'll be better. We won't have an economic downturn. We'll have more money uh, to deposit into those pensions. But that is going to have to be one of our priorities when we get back. Well, up that there. leads nicely into the next subject, okay. in, which I think is dear to your heart because you're in the insurance business. Right. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. Quickly go through your background. Jeff. Well, I, um, I'm a former small business owner. I used to own the Bailey Agency, as I sold that in April. Um, working in the industry still for a different firm out of Glastonbury. Um, so I have a background in insurance. I do you know, insurance for fire departments. I have experience with the st student health program, so I've built health plans in the past. Um, and of course, I, as far as polit politics are concerned, I've been a member of the RTM here in Groton. I've uh, been a member of the town council and right. uh, served on a variety of boards and commissions and right. uh, currently serve on the state of Connecticut Economic Competitiveness Committee or commission. That's hard yeah. to say fast. We'll and uh, have also a previous state representative. So John brought me a lot of light to me on the Connecticut health insurance for non-teachers, for everybody else. And... Um, I don't know if you want to explain it or I so explain the, it. If, if you're I'm amazed. It, it's you. it's an interesting thing. So, and I hope people that aren't state employees think about this. The the state of Connecticut uh, benefits are are very generous. You know, they, in, if you buy health insurance through your employer um, or get it through the exchange, if you're buying it on your own, right. um, they're, they're colored uh, by bronze, silver, uh, gold, and platinum. Right. Right. Um, the state of Connecticut employee health plan doesn't even meet any of those colors. It's yeah. it's like a triple Bentley. Right. Um, so uh, you have a, a $15 copay to see any doctor you want. You have a $5 prescription benefit. Um, some uh, prescriptions are free uh, if you're like on high blood pressure medication or something like that. And there's no deductible, uh, which uh, if... Can you imagine, folks, yeah. no deductible? Wouldn't you so, want to love to have a plan like that? It's, it's, uh, so if, you're in a, if you sign up for what they call the health enhancement program, which means that you swear and promise that you will get a physical exam, get your eyes checked, um, and based on age, get all those other tests like a colonoscopy or a mammography and all that stuff, uh, if you promise to do all those things and actually get them done, uh, employees get a discount on their premium and the deductible is waived. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's almost 100% So you credit. only have to work for the state of Connecticut 10 years, right? To right, get so it's, it's, a life. it's a benefit. So depending on when you started with the state of Connecticut, um, and they've started to ex extend that length of time, but for the most part, most of us are, are 10 years, uh, you get to keep that health plan uh, for the rest of your life. Um, and even when you turn 65 and go on Medicare, um, they uh, will reimburse you. They'll continue to insure you on the state health plan, but they'll reimburse you for the money that's deducted from your Social Security check to cover um, Part A and B. When you you think any company, the big you think Apple Computer offers this? No way. No, probably not. No way. Yeah. No, no way. They they go bankrupt. Right. But the state of Canada, it's so bad that Representative Courtney, Senator Blumenthal, and Senator Murphy, who have all had office positions in mm -hmm. the state of They've Connecticut, all met their ten years. they turned down their federal insurance as being senator and representatives in Washington right. because the plan they get in Connecticut is better. That's right. How can we afford this, folks? You don't. So the other thing John did two years ago, he said, Let's offer everybody a gold plan, which 99% of you don't have out there. Most people have a bronze plan, right? right? So working from the exchange, uh, there was a, at the time, there was a very popularly sold gold plan uh, from Anthony Blue Cross Blue Shield. And so I, I went to the Office of Fiscal Analysis and said, just He's humor me. It's a nonpartisan office, office that we can go to as right. legislators right. and right. just ask for a study. Right. And I said, you know, what if the state of Connecticut health plan was this plan design? What would we save? And it, the answer was $400 million a year. Unbelievable. And it, Folks, we're heading towards this. This is going to, I should have put Connecticut's name in here. We can't keep this going. We right. can't. Okay. So what are you going to do about it? Well, I mean, if, if I get a, back there, we'll, yeah. I'll work. I mean, it's the governor's office that ultimately has the power to uh, break open a union contract. I, I think it's worth having a discussion. I mean, the reality is that any, anybody working for a municipality 
uh, is probably looking at a health savings account style health plan where they, uh, an individual deductible is three grand and a family deductible could be as much as 10 grand or more. Um, so, uh, you know, health insurance, the, 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 more, the less you pay out of pocket, the more expensive the plan That's is. Um, and, and that and more expensive is on your shoulders, right. you citizens' shoulders, That's okay? Right. And none of you have a chance to get a plan like this. None unless, you got, unless you're working for the state of Connecticut. Unless you're working for the right. state of Connecticut. We didn't have time to look at other states, but... Uh, well, I did briefly take a look at the state of New York, and it is common for other states. It looks like New York has a very similar plan design, except yeah, their copays are Yeah, but it's a little higher. The copays are yeah, higher. They're more Instead of having normal. a $15 copay, it was right. like a 25 right. for primary and a 40 right. for... But it would be an interesting study to see. Right. But that doesn't mean it's right if other states no, have it. No, no, Especially not. New York's another liberal state. So right. I like to look at Wisconsin, right. a more conservative state sure. that has a, maybe a balanced right. budget. All right. Um, so we need to gain... Bob Stefanowski has to... He can't say how he's going to fix this because he's got to get in there and read these contracts. And there's there's dozens of contracts. That's right. why he can't say, you know, the press keeps pressuring. What do you, what do you... Be more specific. He can't. But he's got to deal with each contract individually to put pressure on these unions to, to, to say uncle, essentially. Right. Okay? Right. And I'm sure you're going to help him with that. Um, lock boxes and tolls. <laughs> Let's talk about it. So on the ballot this fall, you'll, you're going to see um, a, a constitutional amendment question. Now, there's going to be a lot of questions because you've got the, the charter change as well. And I think right. there's a couple Next of Next week. Uh, I think there's a couple of other that. state questions. But one of the questions on the ballot will be for the creation of a constitutional transportation lockbox. Right. Um, it is a bad idea. Uh, to and it's not really a locks box, folks. They can get in it. Well, no. Once, once the money goes into the lockbox, they it has to be it spent. They can use it for other things? It has to be spent. By the way that the, it's okay. being put into the Constitution, the money has to be spent on roads and bridges here in the state of Connecticut, or transportation items. That said, the way the thing is written, it says, as the legislatures exist every two years, so every two years the body turns over, um, it is the legislature that decides how much money and what money gets put into that lockbox. And so if we're having a lean year, the legislature may decide to put nothing in that lockbox. Right. And, and to tie that to the tolls, the, the toll language is not constitutionally amended. There's it, no tie in this. No, it's, so it's, it basically it's another law. So the tolls could go in the general fund. It, absolutely, absolutely. There's nothing to say that they, you know, they'll promise on a stack of Bibles that when we put tolls... And we're they probably put, will because they don't want it to be... Well, they'll, they'll promise to put the money into the lockbox, right, but two years right, later right. when a third of the body turns over and right. financial times aren't doing well, right. they won't put any of it or they'll keep some of it. I mean, it, the, the tolls in the state of Connecticut will get squandered just like the income tax has been squandered. The casino over the last revenue. 20, yeah, I mean, all of this. So, income tax, 25 years ago they implemented it, it was three tiers. Now it's up to seven tiers yeah. of income. So, th there were three income tiers based on certain levels, and I think the highest tax was 3%. Now there's seven tiers, and the highest tax is 7%. And that's one of the reasons why we're seeing such a mass exodus is those people that are, get, that are having to pay 7%, there's no deduction like there is on the federal taxes. So, they, it's 7% right off the top. Those are the people that are making the decisions. Those are the people that have the money to open up a business here in the state of Connecticut. Right. Or they're the ones that have the, the negotiating ability to say, because they're, they're running a division of a major corporation here in the state of Connecticut, to say, let's move. And, and that's, that's what we got to take a look at. I mean, that those, 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 all those tiers are, are, are ineffective and they're creating a mass exodus. Um, and then if you throw tolls on the situation and bring it back to the tolls, um, is that they, you know, the numbers we're seeing is it'll, it'll be about 10 cents a mile off peak because they're gonna, I think they're going to do congestion tolling. So if you're normally driving to work at 8 o'clock because you've got to be at work at 8.30, that could be a congested time period, which means the toll you're going to pay could right. be double or more. Right. Um, so it, it's. Well, and, you think and again, we're going to get Rhode Islanders coming to work? EB is having trouble getting people well, now. Well, EB is losing a lot of people a month just because they're getting old and retiring. Right. So they're actively seeking replacement employees. The, the, the state is creating schools, both states are creating schools that can train individuals to be welders and pipe fitters and, and carpenters and all that stuff. But the reality is, if you've got someone from Rhode Island, who maybe has got a great job making 50 grand, but their commute is short, they don't have to pay any tolls in Rhode Island. They're getting offered a job uh, at EB in Groton, which right. may also be about 50 grand. Right. 
But then it's, it's looking like somebody commuting in from Rhode Island under the toll structures and toll numbers Being that I'm seeing. Offered. Um, they're going to end up paying $3,000 a year in tolls. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's that's going to very badly impact our two largest employers here in our in the 40th district, EB right. and Pfizer. Right. You hear this, Mr. Lamont? So okay. address it. Okay. You know, and is this almost like a kindergarten statement? But just because everybody else is doing it doesn't mean we should do it too. Exactly. And and that's why I, I don't tolls. I don't think will work in Connecticut. Um, I mean, let everybody else do it. But I don't think we should. I'm going to skip a little here because um, this one's amazing to me. Uh, how how the unions can get or can make things law um and let me get you have two sessions or one from the long session is january to june that's in your first year in office right. and the second session is february to may that's called the short session right if there's legislation that's uh if there's a contract that comes up with a union right they can attach anything to it and the terms of the contract and they it gets they can propose it. It gets carried by your democratic, uh, you know, uh, people who are in the, your positions now. They carry it to the attorney general. The attorney general stamps it and says it's fine. And if the legislation doesn't get acted upon by the by the House and Senate in 30 days, well, let, let me let me try to explain it a little bit differently. So. Uh, it, unions are always renegotiating their contracts, or, right. or, or but know, they, they come up at all. Well, times. they come up at all different times. So when a contract tr contract is expiring, uh, they do their negotiations between the union and the state. They come up with an agreement. The union, the body, the members of the union vote on it, and if it's been approved by the body of the union, then right. it goes to the state of Connecticut attorney general. Right. If he blesses it, right. it goes on the legislative calendar. If 30 days go by and the legislature hasn't acted on that contract, it becomes the law right. of the land. Now, the reason I call the unions the fourth branch of government is it, if a union wants to put something in their union contract that changes fully vetted Connecticut state law, and when I say fully vetted Connecticut state law, it means that you know, a, a legislat legislator like myself suggested the law, it went before the committee, it got voted out of committee. But even the terms of their agreement, too. Right, right. So, uh, yeah, but a, a Connecticut law has to go through committee. It has to be debated right. on the House right. floor. It has to be debated right. so on the Senate it in floor. So they the fall. Right. <laughs> right. Smart. But, right. So I'm, I'm just explaining what Connecticut law, how Connecticut right. law works, right. and the governor signs it. In a union contract, they can include something that would change fully right. vetted Connecticut right. law. And if it's off season, there's a very good chance that it would hit right. the 30 days. Right. But also the terms of the We don't have, ne folks, we don't have good negotiators uh, working for the governor, they're they're very union oriented. Mm -hmm. We we that's what Stefanowski's got to get a team that works with him that's looking out for you right. first. You're number one. Right. So we don't have good negotiators. So this thing, the terms of their agreement, plus all the things they they coattailed onto it, right, right. become law automatically because there's right. no they're not in session. Right. I I actually saw a couple of those happen. Now when I was up there. The, it, it, there was not enough uh, pressure on the Republican side because the numbers were bigger. So union contracts just breezed through on the 30-day calendar. Now, in the last two years, they, they've been better about that, and they are voting on, on those union contracts. But if the body of the legislature changes where the Democrats have a bigger majority again, then you're going to see those union contracts uh, just sit on the clock and become the law of the land after 30 days. Let's talk about economic development. Mm -hmm. We've got manufacturing we want to bring here mm -hmm. we have tourism because we're on the ocean you were on the uh what's a farce uh, economic development committee the, uh, i'm on the economic development uh economic competitiveness commission at the state commission. of Connecticut. okay we have not met in several months um i, I joined it uh, two years ago heather summers uh, was a member of it and when she became a senator she couldn't give it the time so she uh asked that i fill in the spot and so i mm -hmm. took the spot um, mm -hmm. But, you know, we're, we're supposed to meet regularly to look at ways to make the state of Connecticut more competitive. Um, it's been a so while. It, so. It's a farce. Right. It's like Groton's Economic Development Commission. They do not. There's nothing. I mean, one of the things I was very involved in when I was in Hartford was the Tourism Caucus. Um, you know, tourism is big here in eastern Connecticut, um, and it needs our support on a state level. Um, the governor and his uh, um, finance director, Ben Barnes, uh, it just blows my mind that they've cut the marketing dollars. Uh, you know, when you spend, when you stay in a hotel here in Connecticut, there's a hotel tax that's pretty close to 15%. Uh, 
and that money, at least half of it, was supposed to go towards marketing dollars. It is a well-studied, well-known fact that when you spend one dollar advertising tourism in a state, mm -hmm. that you get any at least three dollars back in revenue from either income taxes or sales taxes, right. and most of the time it's somewhere around. It has a multiplier. Around, it has a multiplier. Most of the time it's seven dollars. Right. I mean, we live. I mean, we've got Mystic, right. and and we've got you know the, there's the the ropes course that's off of ninety five. I mean, there's there's all kinds of tourism well, things. My big gripe is. Nobody knows about, I have to, because I own commercial land here, and right. I'm trying to market it, and nobody in Massachusetts knows anything about what's going on in Groton with all the hiring. Right. We're a horrible, horrible market. And I think the state, not just the local, and the, the town of Groton's lousy at it too, but the state should be a big help. This is our biggest manufacturer in the I, state. I agree. I mean, the, the, state of, the state of Connecticut has actually got itself a fairly poor reputation based on the taxing decisions and the regulatory decisions. You know, another story I tell all the time, but first of all, I don't think in the climate that we're in, and it'll be probably a decade before we can say that we've got a, a win where somebody the size of Pfizer has decided to move into Connecticut. But we need to create an environment where we can have business kind of start on a grassroots level. And, and an example is right here in Groton. We've got an amazing shellfishing community here. Mm. Um, you know, we, we have oyster, farms, and oysters, oyster beds, and, and, yeah. and they're the best oysters. They win all kinds right. of awards. Right. And they had figured out uh, a way to pre-harvest oysters and safely yeah. store them in sterile salt water, yeah. knowing that if a major rain event, a hurricane, or, or if there's a, 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 mm. just a, like a week of right. rain, because if they get two inches of rain, they have to shut down the beds for, I think, a month, or maybe a little less than that. But they yeah. have to, it's a good period of time where they have to shut those beds so like down. So they take them in? So they figured out that they could pre-harvest the oysters, keep them safe and sterile right. in the salt water. Hmm. They, they created this plan. Hmm. Now, they followed all the rules of the Federal Food and Drug Administration. Bet you didn't know that we have a Department of Aquaculture here in the state yeah, of Connecticut. And for of seven, seven years, they chased a, a finish line that they never could get across because this Department of Aquaculture thought that they knew better than the FDA, mm -hmm. and they gave up. This is an entity that could have had 300 jobs, wow. and now we only have 50. Wow. And that's just one example. I mean, it, 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 wow. it, that's why I say we've got to look, you know, we've got to get Republican in control in the governor's mansion and in the legislature, and especially in the governor's mansion, because that'll change over all of the commissioners right. that run all these different right. departments. Right. Like we got to take a look at... Is yeah. Secretary's equivalent. Well, there was a John Lender story in the Hartford Current over the weekend talks about the fact that all of the commissioners have been given notice that depending on who becomes governor, they right. may be out of a job yeah. in January. Right. Of um, course. I hope so. And I hope it's because we have a Republican governor. Because right. these regulations, are, you know, they, just using that shell fishing story as a great example, it didn't need to be that onerous. Right. And, and, you know, maybe there's a few steps just for environmental purposes and public safety. But I bet those people are safety. still employed in that department. For what reason? What are they regulating? There's nothing to regulate. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, it right. seems like the, the purpose of things gets lost. Right. And that's, oh, I was a landlord. I got out of the business because I couldn't, the regulations killed me. The state right. killed me. Right. Okay? And that's, and that's what we need to change in the state. We need to create a business-friendly environment, and that's what we don't have. You know, I, you know I, I'm in the business of selling insurance to businesses, and you just can't do it um, anymore here in the state of Connecticut. I mean, it, 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 there, nobody is sitting down. And I, and I talk to people, and I, you know, I'm knocking on doors, and, and, I, and I, you, you see people that are maybe retired early from EB or Pfizer, or maybe they got forced out because Pfizer you know, let a lot of scientists go. And I say to them, you know, there's got to be current and former scientists from Pfizer and current and former engineers from EB right. that have got that next Eureka idea, right. something right. that maybe they'll start in the garage of their house. Well, that's how uh, California, sure. uh, well, that's Silicon how Valley right. started. Well, HP is it's a great example. Offshoots. That was a business that started in somebody's garage. Right. So, right. but what? It, but, but how many offshoots have come from HP? Well, true. Scores. Scores of them. But but you know, the, but it, the problem though is that 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 individual, that person that's got that great eureka idea, they're going to start to put together a business plan, right. and they're going to look at the taxing and the regulatory right. issues. They here say in the state. goodbye. Exactly. Goodbye. Yep. Yep. And that's what we're going to change. We we need change uh, to turn the ship around. So on Shake Up Groton or Shake Up Connecticut today, you've heard more ideas than I think you've heard from Ned Lamont or. Bob Stefanowski. Let's hope he's listening. Um, be, from John, because he spent two years in the house already. Right. He's low. Right. We could go on for hours sure. here. We've sure. got many more things. I don't think Christine Conley and Joe Delacruz have have done absolutely nothing 
to handle, to solve these problems. I don't even think they're aware of these things we've discussed. Right. Okay? A new governor, and I hope and pray it's Bob, too. needs to find leverage um, to, oh, to on these unions. And it requires going through each of these contracts and figure out how we can force them to the table. Okay? And, and I believe if this doesn't happen, Connecticut will not have money. There will be a point in time we will not be able to give checks out. I think it's coming. Um, and I think if that point comes, the federal government will have, and they're broke too, will have to come step in. Right. It will be unprecedented in the United States that a state has to be managed by the federal yeah, government. I, I don't know how that works. I know we are not allowed to We're in uncharted territory yeah, here. But okay? financially, we're in trouble. And there could be rioting in the streets. I don't want to scare right. it, but it, it's scary. Um, from 1970, we have moved from being one of the most prosperous states in the country to being second to Puerto Rico, okay? I think a it's, lot of that has to do with income tax. It's, it's, it's embarrassing. Right. Malloy should be embarrassed, okay? So why do we want to... Uh, Lamont's from the same party. I don't understand why people think. Lamont's distancing himself from his own party. It makes no sense why he would be any different. Well, what's the clear definition of insanity but doing the same thing over and over again and right. expecting a different result? The next government has to set a tone of fiscal conservative. Right. It has to be conservative, uh, and and they they've done nothing. They've had eight years and they've done nothing. So only Bob Stefanowski in a supportive Republican House and Senate has a chance to pull us out of this spiraling downward situation. Unless you, again, unless you're benefiting personally from this by getting state aid or you have a job. And even if you have a job, you should, because I don't think your job is going to survive. And don't think you're going to get these retirements. It's not going to happen. You should be. I think if you vote for Bob, there'll be a chance of getting some of your retirement. If you let it keep going, there's going to be a chance you're not going to get anything. So I don't see where there's a choice here. Um, so please, vote for Bob Stefanowski, vote for John Scott, vote for Ken Richards, who are both from this area, yep. on November 6th. So, have a pen and paper ready. This show, which I'm calling the Dire Strait Show for Connecticut, will show Tuesday at 8.30, um, Thursday at 8 o'clock, Saturday at 9.30, um, and it's the 20. Uh, that's the days coming up, and my show that's going to be on the Charter Revision will be showing October 29th, uh, which is Monday at 5, Wednesday at 9, Friday at 7, and Sunday at 7. So vote to save Connecticut November 6th for those who have the capacity to turn our state around, the Republicans. They're the only ones with the capacity and the know-how to do this. I'll see you October 29th at 5 o'clock for my next show and how to vote on the big rotten question and why you should vote uh, yes. Thank you very much. See you next week. <laughs>